So my name is Ellen Kim, um, and I come from Philadelphia, and I am a dermatologist. So I have the privilege of working with um, patients like you um, in the Philadelphia tri-state area. Uh, lymphoma is a cancer of a type of white blood cell called lymphocytes, and it's just one of many white blood cells in the body. And then you've heard the sort of broad terminology of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma versus Hodgkin's lymphoma. And sometimes if you have family members or friends, and if they say, oh, I had lymphoma, they'll use one of these two terms. And if you have CTCL, you feel left out because you don't know, that doesn't sound familiar to you, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But let me try to break it down. So non-Hodgkin's lymphomas um, are basically T-cell lymphomas, NK T-cell lymphomas, and B-cell lymphomas. Those are just different lymphocytes. They have different receptors on their, their surface, and they have different functions. Cutaneous lymphomas are a subset of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So technically, if you have cutaneous lymphoma, you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but a very rare subtype. So it's estimated that probably 1% of all non-Hodgkin's lymphomas are cutaneous lymphoma. They're broken in down into cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, or CTCL, um, that's much easier to say, or cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, CBCL. Um, can I just have a show of hands? Are there any B-cell lymphoma patients in the group today? Okay, good. Wonderful. Okay, touch of it. Oh, so you have both. Yes, that can happen. Some people have both. Okay. So lymphocytes um, are cells that are part of the immune system. So a very common question that people get when they're diagnosed is, well, if I have lymphoma, cancer of a lymphocyte, which is an immune cell, then doesn't that mean my immune system's broken and that... Um, I'm susceptible to, you know, different things from an immune, um, a weak immune system. So that is a very common question, which some of the other speakers will address later today. Um, lymphocytes are part of the immune system. So these are the other cells of the immune system. You can see T cell and B cells listed there. And they all work together and ultimately um, protect our body against infection, um, surveil against uh, skin cancer development or cancer development, and just keep us healthy in general. So we do rely upon it a lot, but there are a lot of other members of the immune system. So especially if you have early stage cutaneous T cell lymphoma or B cell lymphoma, luckily um, your immune, sim immune system is still you know, relatively normal and intact and not compromised quite yet. This is another common question that um, we get. So. When we talk about skin lymphomas, we talked about that they are rare, that they come from lymphocytes that can be B cells or T cells or rarely NK T cells. And then a common question patients have is, well, doesn't that automatically mean it's in my blood because these are made in the bone marrow? Um, and that's a very good question. So this is um, a try an explanation that I give to patients to try to understand. So all lymphocytes, yes, they are made in the bone marrow. Um, and they come out into the blood, and they have capacity to swim in the blood. But if you have CTCL, or cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, that's primary to the skin, and that's the majority of probably most of you here, it is rare that, rarely people can have internal lymphoma that spreads to the skin. Um, that's a slightly different um, subject. But primary skin lymphomas, they are derived from lymphocytes that um, are what we call skin lymphocytes. So after they've left the bone marrow, um, they've been assigned the job to protect the skin. And they become um, pretty much permanent residents of the skin where they can swim in the blood to other parts of the skin. They sometimes they do go to the lymph nodes um, as well, but their primary form of residence is the skin. So that's why early stage patients, often we say that it's a skin-limited lymphoma. Now, more advanced patients, a subset of patients, it can become more serious. It can spread into the blood and the lymph nodes and other areas of the body. So that can happen. But most patients who are diagnosed early, uh, it's from this skin population of lymphocytes that um, really, for, they, they have receptors that they make them want to live in the skin, and their job is primarily to protect the skin. So it's one of those that has misbehaved and turned into a cancer, a cancer cell. So uh, Brett alluded to this, and so did Susan. Um, so initially, when you're diagnosed with a rare cancer, it's very isolating um, because you don't know anybody else who has it. You can't share stories with them. Uh, and also, you can't find information about it, particularly um, 
if you're in a smaller town or area. And when you try to do an internet search, you know, sometimes the information may not be reliable or old. So that's um, the stressful thing about having something rare. But in some ways, as I think you go on this journey, you'll realize that actually when you have something rare and you find your community through cutaneous lymphoma foundation, or in my case, the cutaneous lymphoma scientific and medical community, it's really a special thing because the people who um, care for rare diseases or involved in rare diseases, um, I think that um, you realize that your voice counts. Each individual patient's voice counts. That sometimes gets a little bit lost when you have an extremely common cancer. Uh, so while there are strength in numbers, I think there is something special about being part of a, uh, a, a unique group. When you um, have been given the diagnosis of CTCL, it is important to know your subtype. So we often use the term CTCL as a broad category, and the vast majority of CTCL patients have mycosis fungoides sesri syndrome. Um, that is the majority, probably 60% of CTCL patients have those two diagnoses. But there are other CTCLs out there, so it is important to know it because um, CTCLs are a pretty heterogeneous category. Okay, so you can talk about Northeast U.S., and there are a lot of states in the Northeast U.S., but if you were to say that Massachusetts is exactly like Maine or like Rhode Island, I'm pretty sure the residents would tell you, no, that's not true. There are some important differences. So it is important to know your subtype. Now, some of these terms, of course, are very convoluted, hard to remember, um, difficult to pronounce. Um, so, you know, we often abbreviate things. The second most common subtype is what we call the CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders. And uh, there's one called lymphoma type papulosis, or LYP. And the second one's called primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. But just know that among your, you know, uh, fellow patients who have CTCL, um, they might not all have the same type. So that's important to know when you're reading about treatment suggestions or experiences that you have to kind of know that you're in the same subgroup. And then there are some even rarer, what we call in medical, um, the medical field, zebras, okay? They, these, are, these are types of CTCLs that are out there that are a lot less common than mycosis fungoides, sesri syndrome, and LYP, ALCL. And these are 10% of CTCLs. So there's a, a mixed bag of different disorders here. And so essentially, this is really important when you work with your multidisciplinary group to get diagnosed, um, to know what subtype you have. Because they, again, there are some subtypes that are move very slowly, and there are other subtypes that we have to keep a closer eye on patients. Cutaneous B cell lymphoma or primary cutaneous B cell lymphoma is less common. It's just it's less common than cutaneous T cell lymphomas. Um, here are some names of the um, what we call the indolent subtypes. So there's one called primary cutaneous follicle center cell, primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphoma, and then we have the diffuse large B cell lymphomas. For B cell lymphoma patients um, of the skin, it's uh, they have. Um, some of the challenges of trying to get education about this disease is there are lots and lots of s patients who have systemic B cell lymphoma. Okay, so that's a quite common group of disorders. And sometimes when you do Google searches for follicle center cell lymphoma, most of the stuff that's out there is going to be for people who have that internally in their lymph nodes or their bone marrow. And so it's very important if you have these um, primary cutaneous B cell lymphomas that you sift through the information or really talk to your, t your healthcare team and also go to the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation website for reliable information about what applies to you. So the terminology can get very, very confusing, but again, if you have cutaneous lymphoma, primary cutaneous means it's really derived from skin lymphocytes, uh, and that is really the specific um, thing you should be looking for. So another common question that I get um, is, the, is, why did it take so long to get di diagnosed? Um, this is perhaps um, one of the most frustrating things for patients who go through this. And so I've thought about this issue a lot over the years, and here are some, some thoughts. And I would love to hear any stories or questions that people have. Um, so cutaneous lymphomas take a time to diagnose. It's not a cancer that we get screening tests for. So for women, we get mammograms or we do self-breast um, exams. You get a colonoscopy once you turn 50. Um, and by the way, those are still very important things to get screened for. 
So that's one thing I, I emphasize to all my patients with cutaneous lymphomas. While this becomes the center of your life, as you get used to the diagnosis and treatment plan, don't, don't fail to neglect other aspects of taking care of your health um, because those are still important and some might argue more important for your long-term health if you have early stage um, lymphoma. So these are rare, and we don't have a specific tumor marker or blood test to detect early disease. And furthermore, most doctors have never, in the community, in private practice, um, I would say that most primary care doctors have never seen a case and, or heard of it, and um, a dermatologist in private practice might see one case a year. Okay, just to give you a sense of how rare it is. So it's not on their radar most of the time. And then... Um, it can look very similar to benign skin lesions, so particularly for CTCLs. So the hallmark, um, as mentioned earlier, is that um, uh, mycosis fungoides can look a lot, because it's scaly and pink, can look a lot like psoriasis or eczema. And those are just so much more common. And it looks identical to the clinician. So that can be a very challenging thing for, for doctors and, and patients. Um, and then I guess the third point is that it can have a very prolonged precancerous phase. Um, so these are, fortunately, many patients have slow-moving disorders, meaning that the cancer cells are not aggressive. Um, but then the bad side of that is that since they don't look that bad under the microscope and they don't behave that badly, and we don't have a tumor marker, then it's hard to diagnose it early. So... Um, even if you have a doctor who biopsies your rash or your papule or your nodule, often the biopsy comes back non-diagnostic. So who here was told they had like non-diagnostic biopsies or were told their biopsies looked benign over the years before they were diagnosed? Okay, so that can happen. And it's not through um, negligence of the doctor or the pathologist or it's just that's the way the disease is, is that the cancer cells are not particularly conspicuous for some of the disorders, um, there can be um, the pathology may be nonspecific, and it may just take a long time for the con condition to declare itself, to be completely frank. So that is one issue to keep in mind. There are many factors that contribute to delay in diagnosis. Um, and it's one of the, the goals of the cutaneous lymphoma of, of, of all of us, all of us um, scientists and doctors, how can we diagnose people earlier so they don't have to go through this, this frustration? So just to give you an idea, this is my clinic. So I have patients who have these different subtypes of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, um, and here are some of the rarer ones. But I also see lots of patients who fall into that precancerous or I don't know or non-diagnostic. So these are some of the diagnoses that people get labeled with for years that it's not MF yet, it's not CTCL yet, but it could turn into it, so we have to keep an eye on them and keep rebiopsying them and treat them. But this is part of the frustration. Okay. So I'm going to switch to um, how do we take care of this disease. And you've heard about this before for other cancers. Um, it's called the multidisciplinary approach. So um, almost all cancers today really do rely upon the skills, talent, services of multiple different healthcare providers. And so, of course, for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and B-cell lymphomas, often the dermatologist plays a primary role for early stage disease and diagnosis because it presents on the skin. Then for some patients, um, we do rely upon medical oncology because we do have patients who either present with or progress to advanced stage disease. Um, and so we rely on them for IV therapies or oral chemotherapies or bone marrow transplant. We have radiation oncology, so radiation therapy is an extremely important therapeutic modality for both types of uh, lymphomas, CTCL and CBCL. And then we have pathologists. Um, these are The pathologists are sort of the unsung heroes of the multidisciplinary group. You might get an explanation of benefits or bill, and you see some mysterious doctor's name reading your pathology. Well, that's the pathologist. And they play a huge role in looking at your skin biopsies, your lymph node biopsies, um, to help make the diagnosis. Hematopathologists, they review your specialized blood work, because you often sometimes need um, specialized blood work. And then surgical oncologists play a role if you need lymph nodes removed for staging. That does not apply to most uh, patients who are especially early stage. 
And then I would argue that now, because we're trying to do personalized medicine, we're trying to identify patients like which treatments are best um, or which treatments might cause more side effects in patients. We do also are, have a lot, there are some centers that will ask you to, um, with your permission, to undergo studies, skin biopsies, and blood work to collaborate with basic science researchers. So if you have doctors who ask you whether you would be involved with those studies, like you want, will you let us take an additional biopsy or additional two tubes of blood, those basic science researchers are doing very special molecular studies, genetic studies, um, to try to answer the questions, can we refine which patients will do better which, with, with which therapies? That's the bottom line. So I would argue that they're becoming part of our multidisciplinary group. And then we do rely very, very heavily for patient education purposes, for with regards to therapy and side effects. Um, nurse practitioners, um, registered nurses um, play a huge role. Um, I left off this... Uh, list pharmacists, so especially specialty pharmacists at the medical centers. Um, of course, cutaneous lymphoma foundation and patient advocacy groups are a linchpin of this multi-D approach, and of course, social work um, for navigating some of the challenges with getting to therapy or, or funding therapy. So the multidisciplinary team, this is a pretty holistic view, but I would argue that if you, really you should have this all in place um, to really del del deliver the best care. And then you'll notice here that I put specialist and local. So because we live um, in a big country and a lot of the specialty centers are in cities that are very stressful to drive to and um, park at, um, and also a lot of the therapy has to be delivered locally. Okay, so Brett mentioned phototherapy. Um, phototherapy is available at University of Pennsylvania, but if you live 60 miles away, I'm not going to ask you to come three times a week to get phototherapy at Penn. So we do have to, we do partner with many excellent dermatologists to get phototherapy and local therapies, um, and also local oncologists and local radiation oncologists to get therapy, um, because that really is the best way to deliver care. So there are many, many excellent local dermatologists or providers who are not necessarily devoted to just seeing cutaneous lymphoma, um, but they partner with us, and, and that's really important um, to keep in mind. So this is an example of the Penn uh, multidisciplinary group here, um, and it's really fun to work with them, and they're just a great group of dedicated people. Okay, so moving on to cutaneous lymphomas in terms of cause. So uh, this is usually probably the first question that patients ask um, when they come. is like, what, what, why did this happen? Um, and it's probably because we're comparing it to known cancers where we know there's a direct link between cause and increased risk. So for instance, as a dermatologist, if you have fair skin and if you um, did tanning booth um, as a young person for many years, um, you increase your risk of melanoma and skin cancers. Uh, if you smoke tobacco, um, then there are certain risk, increased risk of certain lung cancers, bladder cancer, other cancers. So that is well known to most of you. And I think it's a natural um, inclination of us to try to figure out why we got cutaneous lymphoma. So I have to say that um, even at this most recent conference that um, the World Congress, there, had, there were some interesting presentations of looking at sort of what what is causing this? Um, so I think the bottom line is we don't know. Okay, so that, that is the bottom line for CTCL and primary cutaneous B-cell lymphomas. What have they looked at and what is being proposed? Well, um, it is felt that most cutaneous lymphoma, most lymphomas, not just cutaneous lymphomas, um, there is an increased risk of age and we are getting older as a population. Um, so it may be one of those cancers that just results from random errors that occur in our body when cells divide, and those cells just poop out after we get to a certain age, and they start making more mistakes when they divide. Um, of course, we've looked intensely at chemical exposures. We live in a very chemical-filled environment, let's face it. Um, so they've looked at certain populations like veterans' populations. Um, they're interested in looking at people who are exposed to Agent Orange or certain, you know, living near certain chemical plants. And it's an area that we have a lot of suspicion of, but right now there's no firm, firm evidence of, of cause and effect. Okay, so that is still being looked at, but there's no smoking gun.
Um, and then in terms of infectious exposure, this was very, um, this was studied pretty intensively over the years. They thought there might be um, viruses, like uncommon viruses that might be um, transmitted and causing it. But for most, vast majority of CTCL and kidney B cell lymphoma, this is not, it's not due to infection, it's not due to virus. So it doesn't run in families. It's not caused by genetic defect. You can't get a genetics, you know, test to figure out whether you have it. You can't transmit it to your family members by touch or by, by just passing down the gene. So that's reassuring. It's not something that you have to worry about your kids necessarily getting your offspring. Um, so at least that's good. Um, but it is frustrating. We still don't know what causes it. OK. So treatment approach. So when you hear the word cancer, um, your mind goes 60 miles an hour. But you also think, well, OK, I'm ready. Just tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. Um, and then you prioritize it above all else. And that is true for some cancers. So if you um, get diagnosed with breast cancer, there's a very intensive treatment period where you go through staging, you go through surgery, radiation, maybe chemotherapy, and then a slightly longer phase of maintenance therapy or hormonal therapy. But it's an intensive period. But you can sort of see the finish line. And that's something to look forward to. And for most people, even though it can be very difficult, it is difficult to go through therapy and intensive because you can see the finish line, then um, you, you work toward that goal. For many chronic diseases, but also chronic indolent uh, lymphomas, and cutaneous lymphomas in general are chronic conditions. So again, the good news is for most patients, they're slow moving, and they don't they're not immediately life-threatening for most patients. Sort of the flip side, the bad news, is that they're very hard to cure. Now, that may be, we may not need to cure it, OK? If it stays in early stage, we can live with it. We can peacefully coexist with it. But cure is a word we tend not to use for cutaneous lymphomas. And the reason why we know this is because in the 1960s and 70s, we used to treat patients with cutaneous T cell lymphoma, even with early stage disease with chemotherapy. They used to go straight to the oncologist. They would get IV chemotherapy. And it would work when you were on it for six months. But as soon as you stopped it, the rash would come right back. So you went through all that chemo, and you're back where you were. So they realized that that was not the right approach to take for patients. Let's try treatments that are easier to take, safer, they can be continued either long term or repeated multiple times over the long term. And try that. And they've done studies to show that that approach, where we start slow, start low, go slow for early stage patients, um, we don't have to make patients suffer through aggressive chemotherapy. But then the downside is that you have to realize that it is like managing a chronic condition, like managing diabetes or um, managing rheumatoid arthritis. Um, because right now, we still, we're working very, very hard to try to get towards that cure. But that's just the situation at the moment. So this is the study. It was uh, published back um, in the 1980s, where they essentially um, you know, looked at two approaches, um, really aggressive approaches versus more conservative approaches. So in terms of treatment, um, we basically have some general principles for treating cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And again, remember, you have to first remember what subtype you have. Um, and then those subtypes, you know, you'll talk with your doctor and your care team about sort of what the goals of therapy are. OK, so we essentially first um, decide treatment based on, upon disease stage. And staging is the terminology. I'm not really going to go through it. They may talk about it more later today. But disease stage is essentially um, doctors speak for where is the cancer? Okay, is it just in your skin? or And is it a little bit in your skin or a lot in your skin? Has it decided to go into the lymph nodes a little bit or a lot? Is it in your blood? Again, a little bit or a lot. And then is it internally? And so there are stages for every cancer, not just lymphoma. And then the tempo of disease influences treatment as well. So if somebody says they have a rash for 10 years, they had CTCL for 10 years before it was diagnosed, and it's moving pretty slowly, you know, then we can take our time and pick treatments that you know, don't necessarily have to work immediately. But if we have some patients who have severe itch, or the rash is spreading, um, or they have you know, more worrisome skin lesions, then we 
step it up. Okay, but we, we take that into consideration as well. And it's very important that we kind of balance everything. So the approach to treatment is also kind of holistic, okay, because we have um, to think about the treatments and we individualize it to each patient because we often have to repeat the treatments or continue them over the long term. And so we want to think about side effect profile, both short term and long term. And we also want to just make sure that the skin's in good shape, take good care of it, moisturize, um, treat skin infections. So these are other ancillary issues that we think about when we pick treatment. So that's a very important thing when you compare stories with other patients or go on the listserv. It's so helpful to share experiences, but just remember, bring it back to your care team and let them explain it to you whether that treatment option you heard from your friend, which works so well for them, whether that's right for you because your doctor will take into account your med other medical issues, um, your stage, your particular situation, and other factors. So this is just a slide stating basically the same things, okay? So again, you know, some people feel that, well, if I could just go through six months of therapy and be done with it and not have to worry about it, I don't care how strong it is, but that's not the approach we take for most patients with early stage disease. Um, we, we don't have to rush to get you better, okay? You might hear this terminology, National Comprehensive Cancer Network or NCCN guidelines, and these are like clinical practice guidelines for all non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, and it's a very helpful list to look at, um, and we, you know, we, it often lists the treatments for cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, the more common subtypes. So this is a very blank slide, but I like to just divide up treatments into three very, very basic categories. So um, skin-directed is basically anything that just is either applied or targeted to the skin, um, and generally they do not have internal side effects. Systemic are generally oral or um, injectable medications. Um, so pills you know about, there's different types of injections. There's injections by IV. There's subcutaneous injections you can do at home um, after you've been taught. Um, so those are the basic systemics. Um, and then there's clinical trials. So who here has participated in a clinical trial? Okay. So let me define clinical trials for you. Clinical trials essentially are... Um, Clinical trials are clinical research projects where we recruit patients to test new therapies. It's often therapies. It's not always therapies, but it's often therapies. And that's how new medications get approved by the FDA. Um, and the clinical trials landscape in cutaneous lymphomas is really active because we're trying to find better treatments. And we are trying to find that elusive cure. So clinical trials are frequently brought up by special, specialty CTCL and B-cell lymphoma doctors. Because we don't have a cure, we are anxious to try to develop new therapies. So if you're interested, they are good options if they, they work for you. And I think this is the biggest take-home message, which I alluded to, is one size does not fit all. And that is uh, one of the things about treatment for cutaneous lymphomas that are a little bit, um, also can be frustrating for patients, you know, to try to understand why your doctor recommended X and X treatment. So please go to the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation website, and they really do explain the treatments very accurately uh, and very well. And you can sort of, you know, then take that to your doctor and ask them all these questions. Now, I ignore the elephant in the room, costs. That may be actually probably the number one concern that I have as a clinician, um, and probably you do as a patient at the moment. So these have escalated tremendously, and it's a very difficult thing for having a rare disease because when you have a rare disease, um, even though we have a lot of good therapies, there are no generic competitors because there are not that many patients to sell the medication to. And that's the reality of our healthcare system. So our healthcare system is wonderful because it promotes research and novel therapies and innovation, but the market is driven by how common the disease is. So if you have high blood pressure, you have a lot of options. But if you have CTCL, then that's the problem. So we take that into account. 
Okay, it's not the only factor, but it is important to know uh, because, again, this is long-term management. And then there's treatment availability issues um, we take into account as well. And then this is just a long list of other issues which are equally important to the medical aspect that you'll hear about at this session and other sessions and see on the website. Um, quality of life is a very important issue for people with chronic medical conditions because we don't want to make the treatment worse than your actual medical cancer. Um, so it is important to talk with your care team that if you are having issues with the treatment, you need to bring them up. Um, because it's not just a six month treatment period, it's gonna be off and on long term. Um, one very interesting abstract that was presented by University of Pittsburgh were the needs of caregivers. So I know some, some of you in the audience are caregivers. And that is also, in, for some people, really a full time job, either emotionally or um, in terms of providing care and transportation and moral support. And those are issues that are being brought up uh, more by our field and hopefully will be addressed. So sometimes you will feel this way, um, but I think if you trust your healthcare team and do feel comfortable getting second opinions, that, that is one thing that I think is really um, important to bring up. Um, I think that when you have a rare disease, you are entitled, and in fact you should seek other opinions because it's important to get all the information and knowledge. If you have a doctor who is offended by that, that's not the right doctor for you. So this is the cutaneous lymphoma landscape. So as um, was mentioned, this conference was so inspiring. There's still very active basic science and clinical research. We are so grateful that we can still get research funding for a rare disease. Um, and we're also very grateful for all of the, um, the different, you know, the different therapy companies and pharmaceutical companies that take an interest in this disease. When you become, when you start making a medication for CTCL, it's not because um, of just profit motives. It's because you really want to you know, help the general cause um, of CTC on cutaneous B cell lymphoma. There are newer tools for earlier diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. Um, and so you may be approached by your doctor to talk about things like banking tissue, meaning donating skin biopsies for future research, of course, with your privacy protected. Um, that will help that will help us a lot in terms of trying to get closer to a cure. Um, there are lots of novel skin and systemic therapies you're gonna hear about today. And then I think the most inspiring thing um, is that uh, you will see that we as um, CTCL and cutaneous B cell lymphoma specialists, we're trying to collaborate with our um, colleagues nationally and internationally because strength is in numbers. And if we can pool all of our resources, we will get closer um, to um, helping you, our patients, um, really beat this disease. And I'll take any questions. Good morning. Thank you very much. It was wonderful to hear you. I'm just wondering if there is any uh, lapping over of uh, mycosis fungoides and lymphoproliferative papulosis. I mean, can you, because I've seen two different kinds of reports, pathology reports. One says clearly MS, another says the proliferative papulosis. So I'm unclear, I guess I have to make it very, uh, find out, you know, specifically, or, or if I can find out specifically whether or not I'm one or the other, or am I both? And just one more thing. Um, in 2005, I was diagnosed with this strange T cell lymphoma, was watchful waiting was a diagnosis. Um, I had a tumor in my tongue and in a spot where it never appears and it came back T cell lymphoma. And it wasn't until this year in July in the summer, I had the diagnosis of MF. So <laughs> I'm really rare. <laughs> I don't know what to do with all this. I mean, I'm, you know, I've seen my oncologist and I've been treated topically and it's gone away for now, but um, I'm just concerned. I'm not sure where I really am. Well, I think, <clears throat> so, yeah, I can address that for sure. Um, the answer is yes. Um, let me just back up a little bit, though. So um, I alluded to sometimes diagnosis is very difficult, but I didn't mention that 
figuring out what subtype you are is also sometimes very difficult. And that may be where you are. Um, because there are a couple of um, scenarios that I'm just going to mention briefly. Um, if people want to come and talk to me individually about their individual cases, I'm happy to. But um, just know that the diagnosis of cutaneous lymphomas is not based solely on a PATH report. So that's different from other cancers, where you can get a PATH report, say, that's what I have, and just bring it and show it around. Cutaneous lymphomas require clinical pathologic correlation. What does that mean? That means we need to see what the skin looks like and how it behaves and your history of what that skin rash is doing plus the path to figure out what subtype you are. Because lymphomatoid papulosis, some subtypes of MF, and believe it or not, anaplastic large cell lymphoma can look identical under the microscope and we don't know what, the pathologist cannot tell us which one of those subtypes it is. The dermatologist has to get the history and look at the skin rash and what kind of skin lesions you have to put it all together. So that's maybe the situation going on there. But it brings up a very, very, very important point um, because when, just keep that in mind that the diagnosis of lymphomas is a complex and, and comprehensive thing. It's not just based on a path report or a blood test. So, so on that same note, if it's, uh, you know, if you looking at the histology of it, it is there an algorithm for uh, biopsies you know, sequential biopsies per year, two years, five years, um, or is it just based on clinical findings? Um, you know, if it changes, if it looks different, if it's not reacting to current medications, do we re-biopsy different sites to get a different, and can you have one site appear histologically as brand X and the other site brand Y? You bring up many, um, many. So you're alluding to the fact that if the diagnosis is not, you know, not finalized, how often is there an algorithm? How how often one should be rebiopsied? I think that the you can distill it down that if it's not getting better, then you should rebiopsy. But how often is an individual decision between the practitioner and the patient? Um, while we want to, you know, skin biopsy is pretty easy, we don't want to give our patients too many scars. And, and there are some general principles for biopsy. So in general, you want to pick the most representative lesion or worst lesion. You also want to pick a lesion that hasn't been going through major treatment, like maybe not getting topical steroids for a couple weeks. Um, so there are some general principles. Um, but there are some patients who have just sort of that prolonged precancerous phase or non-diagnostic phase, sometimes for a decade. So we try not to make those patients go through biopsies every two months because it, you know, so my rule of thumb is yes, I think once a year it's good to think about. Definitely every time you flare, like if you flare the worst flare you've ever had, rebiopsy. Uh, if it's the worst it's ever been, rebiopsy. Um, those are those are the for me the times when I rebiopsy. But I have some patients where we because it's so stable, we only biopsy once a year and we see, but then sometimes it it we have the diagnosis and sometimes it's still elusive. But we still do treatment. That's one important to keep it, thing to keep in mind. So if you're in the prolonged precancerous phase of mycosis fungoides, you can start treatment. So phototherapy is used not just for mycosis fungoides, but it's used for many other skin rashes. So most dermatologists won't withhold treatment from you if you don't have a diagnosis yet. We'll try to pick treatments that are useful for a wide variety of skin rashes. They may not work, and we may have to escalate, but um, I don't want you to feel that you're you're missing out on treatments because your diagnosis has not been established. Many of their early treatments for cutaneous T cell lymphoma are used in eczema or psoriasis. So um, we do use those. One of our viewers would like to know if you take patients from Washington, D.C., and uh, how the insurance coverage works from working with out-of-state doctors. Thank you. Well, I, I think that I, I, I think I can speak for any um, specialty center. We take patients from anywhere, as long as, again, there is the insurance issue. So um, most of the academic medical centers, when you call, 
Um, if you have your insurance information available, they will tell you, um, you have to have your card available, you know, you, they will tell you whether the insurance is accepted. Um, and then if it's an issue, then we can certainly try to um, point you to other centers, but the CLF website has a, a, a list of, of compre a comprehensive list of treatment centers. Um, and then, you know, we, we try to try to direct you in the, in the right way. But yes, we will see patients from anywhere. Um, and then in general, if you come from far, we partner with a local, a local provider so that we can deliver the best care. Thank you so much.